rather apparent from these texts in the letter to the Hebrews that these issues were very, very clear and very accessible to the Apostle Paul as he uh, looked and considered the condition of the Hebrew church. And then he thought back uh, to that ancient Hebrew generation that was unbelieving and that were kept out of the promised land, then the, the issues were plain to Paul. He could see that it was unbelief why they were cut off. Uh, he could see um, that God was just in doing this. He could see the, the connection, the correlation, and the, the likenesses between these people he was writing to and the, and the, and the ancients. And so he just, he just laid the, lays this out before him and says that though... Let us therefore fear. See, there, there is a very real connection and responsibility uh, between what has been made known to us in these days and what is available to us and what was made known to them in those days and what was available to them. And so I have uh, I've felt the need for grace from the Lord to be able to run with Paul in his thinking as he's, like the prophet said, running with the swift, that that phrase comes to mind when I think of the Apostle Paul. He, he doesn't have any trouble navigating through these waters, the, the, these waters of truth. He can, uh, he can just make his way right through it, and, and conclusions are obvious to him. And uh, some, of, some of these texts, when I, I read, I think I'm, I'm going to have to pick up the pace here and, and see, see where Paul's been and where Paul's going and, and uh, labor in the word and the doctrine. The gospel was preached... Unto us the gospel was preached. That, that is readily obvious. Jesus sent the apostles into the world, and the gospel was preached. The epistles were written, the gospels were written, and the, the message has continued down through the generations. The church is the pillar and ground of the truth, and the church preaches the gospel. We've had the gospel preached to us because Paul preached the gospel. We've had the gospel preached to us because the message of the gospel is like the, it's like the thrust of salvation. It's a message of what God's done and what Jesus has done and what's been accomplished. Amen. The head of the serpent has been bruised. Sin has been put away. Jesus is exalted. He is given repentance. God is imputing righteousness. That's the message of the gospel. We've had, we have had the gospel preached unto us. But Paul, then Paul says as well as unto them. Now he's talking about the ancient people, that generation that believed not. We've had the gospel preached. I can get a hold of that. We had the gospel preached unto us, as well as unto them. Well, they didn't have the same, the, the gospel in the fullness that we have had preached, unto, but they had the gospel preached unto them. These, this phrase has been ringing in my ears. They had the gospel preached unto them? And I, part of me was saying, how can these things... I felt like Nicodemus. How can these things be? They had the gospel preached unto them? Well, they had the gospel of Canaan. They had the gospel of uh, the Exodus. It wasn't in fullness. The gospel was preached to Abraham, was it not? It wasn't in the, in the fullness and the bright uh, daylight that we have heard the gospel, but the gospel was preached. The gospel was even preached in the garden. It was preached unto them. Now, now, now we're living in the day. The true light is now shining, like, like John said. We're living in the daylight. But they had light then too. Not the same intensity of light, but they had light. God promised, I'll give you the land. They had the gospel preached unto them. The Lord has always worked through a word. He's always making something known by a word from the very beginning. God said. That kind of sets the tone. When God goes to work, it's, it's going to be accompanied with and even accomplished by His word. God said, let there be light. And what happened? There was light. So now we've learned something about God. God spoke and it happened. 
No one hindered him. He wasn't trying things out. Let's see what happens if I say this. God said, let there be light. And precisely what he said happened. And so we have this tutelage. I'm thankful for Brother Given highlighting these things in the book of Genesis. We have this tutelage of God. God said, let the waters bring forth fish. Let the land bring forth beasts. Let, of, let of the ground bring forth herbs. Let, he said, let there be, and it was. So we're learning about God. See the power, the execution of God's word. When he says... It comes to pass. It's not done. He doesn't say A, B, C, and something similar to B and C happen. God said, let there be light, and there was light. Exactly like he said. We've had the gospel preached unto them, to us, and they had the gospel preached unto them. So we've got to establish that when God works, he always speaks. And when he speaks, he always works. And when you see the, the, the execution of the Word of God, of the works of God, is being invested in the Word of God. Yeah. He works by speaking and He speaks by working. So the gospel was preached unto them. Did not Abraham receive a word before anything else was done? Amen. He received a word. And even in Abraham's day, the revelation was incremental it grew and opened up more and more the longer uh, the more time elapsed he said I'll uh, give you the land and it was a great land and he didn't have any offspring well then later he he opened up he promised to him by his word that your inhabitants will be like the stars and like the sand and no, then it was opened up more and more that no, it won't be uh, from a steward in your house. It'll be from your, a child of your own bowels. It was open more and more. But the point is God spoke before he worked. And in fact, because it's God speaking, he is working when he speaks. That's right. can't, that can't always be said of men, of, of the words of men. But when God speaks, it is a work because of the, the power of, that is uh, entrenched, embedded, so to speak, in the Word of God. God, can't, God doesn't speak to no effect. That's right. It's impossible for God's Word to have no effect. Now I'm going to address that. We're going to have to address that because he says in this verse that the Word preached did not profit them. Mm -hmm. So there's some distinctions to be, uh, to be seen here. The Lord sent... Uh, he sent prophets to his people. He didn't send accountants. He sent prophets. He sent messengers that brought a, brought a message to his people. The Lord, in designing and, and building this uh, economy of salvation, he built it with preaching and faith. People who played significant roles in the development of this salvation economy were men of faith, like Abraham, Moses, David, Daniel. They were men of faith. And it was always coupled with what God said. God spoke to Abraham. That's why Abraham's significant. Because God spoke to him and Abraham believed. So Abraham had the gospel preached to him. When God appeared to Moses, he spoke to him. He didn't just give him a marvel to look at. That happened too. But the marvel, he spoke out of the marvel. He gave him a message. And the message preceded the, the deliverance. So they had the gospel preached to them. So a, seeing, seeing that a message is primary in, in the, this economy of God. This economy of salvation, the message preached is of primary importance. Then where does believing rank? How important is believing if what God says is the foundation for all of salvation? The Lord sent a preacher to prepare the way for his son in the world. He sent a preacher. What kind of person, what kind of work do you, do you send uh, before? You send 
the preparatory the preparatory work has to be appropriate for the the work that's coming. If it if it's if it doesn't fit, if it doesn't complement, if the preparatory work doesn't complement the real work, then there's no need in sending the the uh, the one to prepare the way. Because if his work doesn't complement he who follows, then his work really didn't prepare. And God prepared the world for the coming of Jesus with a preacher, one who brought a message. So they had the gospel preached unto him. What was the first thing Jesus did when he sat down on the right hand of God? I should say one of the first things. One of the inaugural works that Jesus did when he sat down at the right hand of God. He poured forth a message. Day of Pentecost. It was a message. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. A message is the power of God. He, in, he has invested... His, his power to save, he's invested it in a message. Something that is spoken and it has to be heard and it has to be believed. And God, he set the stage right from the beginning when the record opens by saying, God said, let there be light and there was light. And we, this, is, this remains consistent throughout the scriptures and has remained consistent throughout the, the history of the world. So just think, when Paul makes this connection between the gospel that we've heard and the gospel that they heard, the gospel that we heard, have heard is sufficient for the work that God's doing in us. The gospel that they heard was sufficient for the work that God was doing in them. Yes, amen. And so we, they, both messages have to be believed. If they're not believed then the people are cut off from the power that the message brought, that the message brings. Here's, here's three texts where the gospel was preached unto them. One in Exodus, one in Leviticus, and one in Numbers. In different books, at different times. One before they came out of Egypt. Two after they've come out of Egypt. But God preached to them through Moses and through other spokesmen. He preached to them the message, the gospel of Canaan. I've never heard anybody say that. that that's just kind of what I've said. The Gospel of Canaan, Exodus 3.17. As I have said, I will bring you up out of the afflictions of Egypt unto the land of the Canaanites. He's preaching the Gospel to them. And the Hittites and the Amorites and the Perizzites, the Hivites, the, Hivites, the Jebusites, unto a land flowing with milk and honey. So there's the message. It's declared. It's been heard. It's been spoken. The promise has been made. I will bring you up and give you the land. So it's settled. They'll possess the land, right? God's already spoken. Leviticus 20, but I said, 20 verse 24, but I have said unto you, ye shall inherit their land. That's rather expressly stated, isn't it? Yeah. You shall inherit their land. And I will give it unto you to possess. Just in case there was any possibility of misunderstanding the first statement I you shall inherit their land in other words not from afar you won't point there and say that's our land even though we don't live there and I will give it unto you to possess it a land that flows with milk and honey I am the Lord your God which have separated you from other people now remember at this point they've already been delivered out of Egypt as God said they would be don't miss this. God said, I'll bring you up out of Egypt, and he brought them up. Now he's saying, I will give you the land of Canaan. It's yet to be seen, but God has said, you shall inherit it. Numbers 33, verses 51 through 54. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, when ye are passed over Jordan into the land of Canaan, then ye shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land from before you. That's a promise. Now, it, it occurred to me that that verse 52, it could be read differently. If someone has this, uh, this bent towards uh, law keeping and rule keeping, then it could, it could read like a law, couldn't it? You shall drive out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It could be read with a different intonation. But you can read it like, if you read it like a promise, you, you shall drive out all the inhabitants of the land. So just think about how the ten, the ten spies must have heard 
You have to go drive out all the inhabitants. And so then they looked, they saw the inhabitants differently. Joshua and Caleb, when they heard verse 52, they probably didn't call it verse 52, but they heard, we will, in, we will drive them out. Amen. It was a revelation to them, but to the 10, it was a commandment. Amen. It was the same word, but point in case, the gospel was being preached to them. Verse 53, And ye shall dispossess the inhabitants of the land and dwell therein, for I have given you the land to possess it. And notice the tenses here. Not I will give it. He has said, I will give you the land. But here he says, I have given. And so when faith hears that and looks over Jordan into the land of Canaan, faith says, that's my land and there's someone living in it. You see how that changes? In verse 54, and ye, and ye shall divide the land. They haven't been driven out yet, but he's giving them this promise. And ye shall divide the land by lot for an inheritance among your families, and the more ye shall give, and to the more ye shall give the more inheritance. And to the fewer ye shall give the less inheritance. Every man is inheritance shall be in the place where his lot falleth, according to the tribes of the families of... Or, According to the tribes of your fathers, ye shall inherit. The gospel has been preached to them. So God has set before them this promise that he will drive out the land, and he gave it to them in a message before he gave them the land. And God has always worked this way. The promise of Isaac came before Isaac. The promise of the Exodus came before Exodus. It always, it always happens uh, this time. And, of course, uh, Moses repeated these promises time and time again in the book of Deuteronomy. So it's not, when they got to the when, the, when the 12 spies went in, this wasn't all new ideas to them. Oh, let's go, they weren't thinking, uh, let's go see if we might be able to take that land. God had already given them this gospel, this message. They had the gospel preached unto them, but the gospel, the word preached did not profit them. Now, once you, you see these issues, of when you can see the, the truth of what God's word does, then read these words. The word preached did not profit them. Well, the, there's a certain emphasis on them. The word, this word, it didn't, think, read it this way, it didn't profit them? How could this word not profit them? Because this is the word of God. So the, the message embedded here is beware of unbelief. We've had the gospel preached unto us as well as unto them. So after they had the gospel preached to them, they, it didn't profit and they didn't possess what God promised. It's because of unbelief. So beware of unbelief. Amen. So what went wrong? The gospel was preached to them, but they didn't possess the land. Has God failed? See, Paul, Paul the Apostle, he posed these um, hypothetical questions sometimes. Did the word of God fail? Well, we say, God forbid. That's right. mm -hmm. The word preached wasn't mixed with faith in them that heard it. Yeah. The promise didn't fail. The people failed. Yeah. God did give them the land. Yeah. It's not as Romans 9 says, it's not as though the word of God has taken none effect. It's not as though the word preached to that generation was preached for naught. It's not that, it, that, it, the, that that message was, was uh, wasted and squandered. It still did a work. It didn't profit the people that didn't believe, but it still did a work. The seed, that was, the seed was not to blame in that vineyard that produced wild grapes. The seed wasn't to blame. It was the soil. It was holy right seed. The, the scriptures tell us it was holy right seed, and it was, but it, yet it yield, yielded uh, uh, wild grapes. It wasn't the, the fault of the, of the seed. Yes, right. So what went wrong? The peop, some of the people that Jesus taught are the people that killed him. Does that mean Jesus' words were deficient? Does it, mean his, does it mean his teaching uh, obviously led them to the wrong conclusion? There was no fault with the word. 
it was not mixed with faith in them that heard it. This is a commentary on people falling away in spite of what was preached to them. That's the condemnation. Is that they had the gospel preached to them and they still didn't believe. The natural mind does not change, cannot change, and will not change. Amen. The gospel was preached to these people, and because there was no faith, even the word of God couldn't change how they were thinking. That which is born of flesh is flesh. And they stand as an example of this. The word spoken to Pharaoh didn't change him. Took the ten plagues before he finally said, Okay, go. And then after they left, he pursued them. <laughs> this is like Pharaoh, Pharaoh and uh, Nebuchadnezzar and others are like, a, like microcosms of the nature of flesh. And here his kingdom is wasted through the process of these ten plagues and uh, Israel being plucked out of his land. And then he chases them. What does he think he's going to do? Does, does he really think that he that he has the upper hand still to bring them back. What did, would he really want them back? Didn't change his mind. The word spoken to the Pharisees, it didn't really change their thinking, did it? If, it? if it wrought any change, it made them harder. The mind of the flesh, Romans 8 tells us, cannot subject itself to the law of God. It can't. So this message that was preached to them, it didn't profit them. It didn't impact. It didn't uh, uh, transform the way they were thinking because it wasn't mixed with faith in them that heard it. So why didn't these people, when they heard the, the gospel of Canaan, why didn't they think about their prior deliverance? Why didn't they make this connection? God's promised to give us that land just like God said he would bring us out of Egypt. I think that God can do that because he did this. They didn't think this way. When they, when they saw the inhabitants of the land, they should have thought, we're going to make you like God made the Egyptians. But they didn't think this way because it wasn't mixed with faith in them that heard it. They didn't make any connection between the land of Canaan and manna. Why not? They've been eating miraculous food through the, through the wilderness, and their clothes didn't wear out miraculously. But they didn't make any connection between the present... A provision of God and the promise that he would give them the land. They, they could have concluded, if it was mixed with faith, they could have concluded God has brought us out of Egypt, God spoiled Pharaoh, God has provided manna, he has sustained our clothes, and so it won't be too difficult for the Lord to give us that land. Amen. But they didn't think this way because the mind of the flesh is not subject to the law of God, and the message wasn't mixed with faith in them that heard it. Now, here, mixed with faith is synonymous with did not believe. It just kind of give, gives us a word picture. Not mixed with faith. So when the, the word, the message hit those people, it, as we say today, it went in one ear and out the other. Yeah, that's right. making, no, making no change in its... It's travel through their ears. Didn't change the way they thought. Faith, the shield of faith, we know, quenches all the fiery darts of the wicked one. So faith diffuses what the devil says. What does unbelief do? It diffuses what God said. It's not, it's not that unbelief overpowers what God's going to do. It diffuses the promises that God has given to your benefit. It diffuses them in you. So God promised to give them the land. They didn't receive it because they didn't believe it. So another generation received the promise. Think about, think about the contrast here that the Holy Spirit is, is providing. His word is with power, but that word did not profit these people. His word is a sword, a sharp two-edged sword, and it didn't profit them who did not believe. His word is a worker, the Holy Spirit said, which the word which effectually works also in you that believe. But it didn't profit them because they didn't believe. Not one of his promises had failed. Wasn't it Solomon who prayed that? Maybe Solomon and Moses. Not one 
good promise has failed of all that God has promised, but that word didn't profit these people. How, how can these things be? God, when God has spoken, and who shall disannul it, the prophet asked. No one disannuls what God said. So, but that word didn't profit. It didn't profit this, this generation. His word does not return unto him void, but it accomplishes the work whereunto I have sent it. Whatever God sent it to do, it does. But it didn't profit this generation. The same, think about this. The same word that created the land of Canaan is the same word that promised to give it to them. And they didn't believe. Which is harder, to drive out the inhabitants or to speak it into creation? He had already spoken it into creation, but they didn't believe that he could drive out the inhabitants and give it to them. When, you're, when your mind is, is accustomed to, to, to traveling in the high places of truth, then uh, doesn't it make unbelief just look absurd? Amen. When you see who God is and what God does, and or He promises, and then someone doesn't believe what God said, what, what would convince you to not believe what God said? The father of lies, that's who. Amen. So that... It's a, it's a good work to stay, to stay in the place, to maintain the place where unbelief is, is absurd. Amen. God cannot lie, but they didn't believe him. He's magnified his word above all of his name, but they didn't believe it. It's a sad commentary. But this is the warning. The gospel was preached unto them but it didn't profit. He's drawing this connection between his readers and this ancient generation because his readers are in the same danger of what God has, say, has said not profiting them because they're not believing it. Not being mixed with faith in them that heard it. For we which have believed do enter into rest. We do, not will, we do. We do enter into rest. When you find someone who's believing, that person has entered into rest. Amen. You've, got to, you've got to have discernment to see it. You've got to have discernment to know it. But we which believe, there's, this is what the apostle has said, we which believe, we which have believed do enter into rest. Mm -hmm. Now, I understand it's not the fullness, but it is rest. We enter into rest. Don't let your thoughts about rest be too simple. If you just think about the world as being toil and heaven as being rest, then you have, you have you've handicapped yourself. We have the first fruits of the land now. We are tasting of the powers of the world to come now. We have the first fruits of the Spirit now. We're sitting with Christ in heavenly places now. We're walking in the light now. We which do believe do enter into rest. This reminds me of uh, Jesus' words in the close of Matthew 11. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Now, this promise and this invitation is given to a specific kind of person. Ye that labor and are heavy laden. Mm -hmm. Come unto me, ye that labor and are heavy laden. Who, who qualifies for this? Those who labor and are heavy laden. Mm -hmm. Is it those who are laboring for the meat that perish? I don't think that's the case. Those who labor and are heavy laden. Is this those who are heavy laden with the weight and the cares of this world? Who heap to themselves the cares of the world and would have it no other way? The promise of those who labor and are heavy laden is those who are heavy laden by the ways of the world because they want free from the ways of the world. That's who this promise is given to those who, are, who, those who labor are laboring to find God, who are laboring for 
an acceptance with God, who want more than anything for God to be pleased with them. That's who are late because here's why I make this conclusion, because the rest that Jesus gives, it, it's desirable to those kind of people. The rest that Jesus gives is not desirable to the people who would be rich in this world. Take my, take my yoke upon you. The, the man of the world would have, have, wants nothing to do with the yoke of Jesus. It's anything but rest for that man. Take my yoke upon you and you'll find rest unto your souls in a yoke. <coughs> See, this is why I said don't, you can't let your thoughts about rest be too simple or this completely eludes you. Yeah. Take my yoke on you and you'll find rest. Amen. That man who, was a, uh, who smote his breast and prayed unto God, God be merciful to me a sinner. He wanted rest for his soul. He was heavy laden. Now, from one perspective, he was no different than other men because he had sinned and come short of the glory of God just like every other man. But the difference was found in that this man, he felt the burden of his sin while the Pharisee didn't. The Pharisee, he couldn't, he was so dull and had grown so hard that he thought he was better than other men. So this promise Take my yoke upon me, ye shall find rest unto your souls. Oh, that would that that sounded so good to this man. He smote his breast. God be merciful to me, a sinner. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Psalm 55 says, Oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then I would fly away and be at rest. Was David really praying that he would find a place just to lie down and do nothing? Yeah, I don't get that idea from reading David. That more than anything, David just wanted for everybody to quit bothering him and to, to lay down and just, just be at ease. You can't convince me that this was really the uh, deep-seated desire of the man after God's own heart. I just don't want to be bothered. Be at rest. He wanted to be freed from the things that distracted he wanted to be freed from the things that obscured. He wanted to have rest from the burden of things that, that kept him from running in the ways of God. That's the, see, that's the rest that, that he wanted. Psalm 38, he said, There's no soundness in my flesh because of thy anger. But think about the connection with we have entered into rest. There's no soundness in my flesh because of thine anger. Neither is there any rest in my bones because of my Sin. We which have believed do enter into rest. Rest is a precious promise to those who have no rest in their bones because of their sin. Now every, from the, from the, uh, the broad perspective, every man and woman in the world has sin. But not everyone is bothered by it. And to the person who is bothered by it, that's the one who's, who is heavy laden yeah, right. that Jesus made this promise to. Him. There's no sin. When Paul says, oh, wretched man that I am, it's because of his sin. And if, Now, Paul said in Philippians 3 <clears throat> that according to the law, he was found blameless. So when he says, oh, wretched man that I am, he's not talking about uh, overt and heinous sins that he's committed before all men. He's, he's found in himself a inherited, an intrinsic sinful nature. That when the law of God said, Thou shalt not covet, that it produced in him all manner yeah. of covetousness. Wretched man that I am. So Paul, he, he felt the burden and the wretchedness that all men own, but not all men feel. So here's, here's one of the, uh, here's a, an example, a gospel example of the rest that Paul found. We which have believed do enter into rest is in the circumcision of Christ, Colossians chapter 2. The circumcision, of, of, circumcision without hands, the removing of the sins of the body of the flesh. There is rest in, when you find the wretched man that's in you, 
And then you find in believing the gospel in the circumcision of the removing of the body of the sins of the flesh. So now, as I strive in this, in this narrow way and labor to find God, it is not I, but sin that dwells in me. Because of this circumcision. So I find rest because he has circumcised, removed from me that wretchedness that I found. So Amen. he which believes do enter into rest. I hope I'm not clouding this up for anyone. <clears throat> Psalm 37. Rest in the Lord and wait patiently for him. Fret not thyself because of him who prospers in his way, because of the man who bringeth wicked devices to pass. Rest in the Lord. Those, <clears throat> this rest in the Lord is found in the midst of wicked devices. Yes, amen. The wicked devices don't, they don't disappear when you find rest. That's right. Think about Jesus. I haven't, this isn't in my notes. This just came to me. Jesus was asleep on a pillow in the boat while the apostles were afraid for their lives. That's like entering into rest. It doesn't mean that because the waters are calm that I have rest. It means you find rest in the Lord in the midst of these wicked devices. Amen. We which have believed do enter into rest. Amen. <clears throat> they have ceased from carrying the weight of sin and guilt. They find rest. They have ceased from walking in the way that seems right unto man. See, there's a fine distinction here in the, the rest that comes from believing the gospel. It doesn't mean that we become idle and carefree because Paul also said, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. I see he that, we that have believed to enter into rest, they have ceased from the works of flesh. They ceased from the, from the cares of this world. Saul Saul of Tarsus was busy when the Lord confronted him on that road that led to Damascus. But, the, but Paul the Apostle was even more busy after that great conversion. Yes. Amen. He had ceased from his own works, mm -hmm. but he hadn't ceased from working. Mm -hmm. Jesus, said, Jesus said, take my yoke and you'll find rest. So there's, there's rest in working together with the Lord. There is no rest in the yoke of man. There is no rest in the yoke of the world. There is rest in the yoke of Jesus. Joshua and Caleb <clears throat> had, uh, had two very contrasting experiences. They had work in Egypt, and they had work in Canaan. Now, I'll leave that to your, your own conclusion of what the differences are between Joshua's work in Egypt and his work in the land of Canaan. Which do you think he did with greater satisfaction? Which do you think he did with, with greater zeal, greater determination? The work in Egypt or the work in Canaan? Now, just, just a few more uh, thoughts here in conclusion. <clears throat> Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. I'm just going to introduce this because it, this, this verse 3, uh, it, the thought here started in this verse 3 is carried through several verses of chapter 4. Although his works were finished from the foundation of the world. He made this promise, they won't enter into my rest, but his works were finished from the foundation of the world. So this work, this rest is much bigger than the seventh day. That's one thing that is, is, is being communicated here. His works were finished from the foundation of the world. So it's not just a rest. We're all going to go back to the seventh day in, in, in the Garden of Eden. He goes on later in the chapter to say that the, this rest is also bigger than Canaan. Because he says, if Joshua had given them rest, then he would have never spoken of another day after that. Amen. So the rest of God is much bigger than the Sabbath day. It's much bigger than the land of promise. Amen. It is 
dwelling in God Himself. Amen. It's the rest of God, not the rest of the Sabbath. It's the rest of God, not the rest of Canaan. Although his works, other versions say, yet his works were finished from the foundation of the world. So what, what, is, what is this promise pointing to? He's promised that, he would, that, you, that, the, that people would enter into his rest, but God has been resting from the foundation of the world. His works were finished from the foundation of the world. There's some, there's some fine distinctions here that, that warrant our, our meditation in seeking seeking the things of God. We do enter into rest. Even though His works have been finished from the foundation of the world, we enter into His rest because He promised that those who believe do enter into rest. So I, I, I trust that the Lord has been able to minister these things, some of these things to you. I, I rejoice in that the Lord has committed the preaching of the gospel through men. And uh, this is not boasting in myself. I, I have confidence in you that you understand uh, what I'm saying because y you all have experienced, as I have this morning, uh, some level of, of dissatisfaction and frustration in the, the limit of your own um, yeah. communicative skills. But the reason I'm rejoicing in this is that the ministry of the truth doesn't depend on my communicative skills. That's why I'm rejoicing. Just think about how different the life of faith would be if God had ordained the preaching of the gospel completely through angels. So when we, when we meet together and we sing, and then at an appointed time, an angel appears and preaches to us. And then when the preaching's done, he ascends back to heaven. Well, there would... Uh, the, the, God, the angel desires to look into these things because he is not participating to the same level that we are. And so God is preaching, God has ordained the preaching of the gospel through the ones who are being saved by the gospel. And so as, as it, I don't know who first said this, but it's been well repeated that the, the true preaching of the gospel is one beggar telling another beggar where to find bread. And so that's how I felt this morning. And so I'll just leave you with this, with this word, brethren. All the beggars before me, there's bread in this text. Yeah.